Good morning and a very warm welcome to worship at Angel Church in Stockett. Welcome especially to any visitors here today and also to those watching the morning service at home. For those present, I invite you to stay for teas and coffees after the service served at the local sanctuary. And I'm delighted to welcome this morning Reverend Dr. Alison Swindells, who has kindly agreed to take our service today. Alison is well known to many of you, but for those who don't know her, Alison was the minister here when this was St. Ninian's Church before the union with Beech Grove Church to form Midstockett Church. She left St. Ninian's at the time of the union in 2005 and then served as minister at Greenbank Parish Church in Edinburgh for 10 years. She then came north again and was minister at Barthel Chapel linked with Tarvis, which became part of for Martin Parish Church, from where she retired at Easter this year. So Alison, we're so pleased to have you back here today. Alison standing in for Tanya, who's still off ill, but I'm pleased to confirm that Tanya is making very good progress, and please keep Tanya in your prayers. There are just a couple of intimations I want to highlight. The Summer Fellowship Coffees continue at the Church Centre um, this Tuesday, 6th of August, from 10.30 until 12. And next Saturday, the 10th of August, um, we have what I know will be a wonderful concert. Alistair Eddy sings jazz, accompanied by Neil Burse on piano. Alistair is the very talented son of Duncan, and the concert's here in the sanctuary at 3 p.m., entry by donation, in aid of the Music at the Stock at Music Fund, and our junior fundraisers are running a stall to raise funds for Cairns counselling. So please do come along to that. Now, I'm happy to hand over to Alison to lead us in worship. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to be back in this building, even if it's very different from the last time I was here. Um, Thank you to Alison for her welcome. Uh, I perhaps should confess right now that this, um, apart from a service taken in my husband's church during General Assembly, this is the first uh, time I've been back in the pulpit since I retired at the beginning of April. So I might be a bit rusty, so I hope you'll be forgiving for that. So. Now, let us worship God. I invite you to stand and join with me in the call to worship. If you join in the part in bold, from different lives, we come to worship. From good weeks and bad weeks, bringing great times and painful memories, we come to worship. Needing healing, needing peace, we come to worship. With hope in our hearts, we come to worship the Almighty God and the King of Kings. Bring to the Lord a glad new song, hymn 106.
before we speak, God knows our needs, yet our words open our hearts to God's grace. Let us prepare ourselves for God's healing as in words and silence we confess all that separates us from God and from one another. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, we come before you buffeted by the storms of life. The winds rage and the seas roar. The problems of life seem about to overwhelm us. Why the natural disasters? Why the death of innocent children? Why so much pain and suffering? Why the senseless cruelty? Why man's inhumanity to man? Why the war and violence? Why the failed relationships? Why the illness that hits us hard? Why the unfairness of life? These doubts and others threaten to engulf us. But to whom can we take these questions if not to you, God, our Creator and our Lover? With whom can we wrestle with these problems if not with you? And so we lay our questions before you in the knowledge that you are reaching out to us in love, love which despite all our doubts and questions will not let us go, love revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. God of beauty and power, healing and silence, haven of stillness in a world of noise, through it all, you are beside us, speaking to us, a still small voice of calm in a world of chaos. Having voiced our protest, we rest in your quietness and calm. But we cannot stay silent. The calm is broken. The screams of fear, the explosions of terrorism, the shelling of withering armed conflict, the blare of greed and careless ambition, the tears of hearts fractured by grief, the plaintive cry of weak voices crying for justice, the whiplash of oppressive regimes, the discord of disagreement and dispute. Teach us, teach us how to speak healing peace and quiet confidence. Enable us to share the painful silence of sorrow and become channels of your grace, forgiveness and peace. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught his friends to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Right. I wonder how many of you have ever been lost using a sat-nav? <laughs> or no one admitting to it? Has anyone been lost when they've used a sat-nav? Have you been in the car and got lost using a sat-nav? 
Yeah, right, okay. And see, let's see if any of anybody else admits to it, will we? Right, anybody else admitting to it? Oh yeah, right, okay, there's a few, good. Well, that's good, I'm glad that we're not the only ones because that's a, a, a bit of a bone of, dis of dissension when we're in the car because when my husband's driving, he puts the sat-nav on but turns the voice off. I think he thinks he's got enough with one bossy woman's voice <laughs> without another one. But he'll switch it off and then we go the wrong way. <laughs> we, get, we miss a turn off and then we have to turn and go back. So often it's our fault that the sat now gets us lost. But there are other occasions when we were on holiday in Pembrokeshire this year and towing a caravan and following the sat nav to the caravan site and it kept trying to take us down these wee narrow lanes and there was absolutely no way you might have tried it with a car but we weren't going to try it with a car and a caravan on the back because that would have been a recipe for disaster so we had to find something else what do you think we used when the sat nav got us lost i'm getting the answer from the adults <laughs> a, a map right a map i've got one here a road map When the sat-nav fails, when the technology fails, you have to turn back to the, the map. But to use a map properly, there's a few things that you need to know. You need to know, first of all, you need to know where you've come from, so you can get the map the right way up. Then you need to know where, you're, where you are at that present point in time, because you might be in another page totally. And then you need to know where you're going. Three things that you need to know when you're using a map. You need to know where you're going, you need to know where you've come from, and you need to know where you are. A bit like life, a bit like the Christian faith. And we're going to be thinking a wee bit more about that later in our service. But just now, we're going to sing again, I think. <laughs> it's, yep. So hymn 245, it's a world of sunshine, a world of rain. First reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 43, reading at verse 18. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. 
The wild animals will honour me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I form for myself, so that they might declare my praise. And then reading from Jeremiah chapter 6 at verse 16. Thus says the Lord, stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way lies and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Also, I raised up sentinels for you. Give heed to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not give heed. Therefore, bear, O nations, and know, O congregation, what will happen to them. Hear, O earth, I am going to bring disaster on this people, the fruit of their schemes, because they have not given heed to my words. And as for my teaching, they have rejected it. And the third reading is from Hebrews chapter 12 at verse 1, the example of Jesus. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary in your souls or lose heart. Amen. We'll now sing together hymn 774, Jesus, name above all names. And we'll sing this twice, and you please remain seated as we sing. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Where have we come from? Where are we now? Where are we going? All questions that we need to have in mind when we look at any map. And as I said earlier, those same questions arise when it comes to the 
to life and faith. For us, the Christian faith has a past, present, and future dimension. And all of these, each of these, is important. So first of all, the past. Now from today's Bible readings, you've probably picked up that there is a tension here. The prophet Isaiah tells us not to look to the former things or consider the things of old. God is about to do something new. And it's beginning to happen even as the prophet speaks. On the other hand, another prophet, Jeremiah, tells us to stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good ways lie and walk in that good way. What on earth is going on here? And what are we to make of this seeming tension about how we should view the past? Let me give you a couple of illustrations that might help. When we were not getting lost in country lanes in Pembrokeshire, Sean and I spent quite a lot of our holiday visiting old churches, a bit of a busman's holiday really. But in fairness, the weather in June did not encourage trips to the beach. And this morning, I'd like to tell you about two of the churches which we visited. The first church is the medieval parish church of St. Lawrence. It's situated in the heart of the market town of Ludlow in Shropshire. Ludlow is one of those beautiful market towns that has kept many of its historic buildings. And as you might expect, the church is full of history. It has one of the finest collections of wood carvings in the UK. But what was most interesting about this church was that while it still provided a beautiful place of worship, with a space for prayer and quiet reflection. There was also a corner for children with craft materials and toys, a place where they could crawl about and release pent-up energies. There was a shop with a selection of Christian books and resources. And there was a cafe where locals and visitors could mix and mingle, and I can vouch for the coffee. That church in Ludlow was a bit like the local synagogues would have been in Jesus', Jesus day, as well as being places of worship and teaching. Those synagogues were centres of community life. And that church in Ludlow seems to have managed to combine all these elements. It still looked and felt like a church. It was still an appropriate place for worship. But the church had evolved and changed to serve its present community. Its history was clear, but that history had become part of a living heritage of faith, engaging all those who crossed the threshold. All were welcome in that place, be they Christians, those of other faiths, those with no faith. But there was an unashamedly Christian witness the church felt alive. That's the first church. The second church that I want to tell you about is located in the central belt of Scotland, and I'm not going to mention its name. It's a historic and iconic church with a rich and fascinating history spanning centuries. The church has played an integral role in many significant events in Scottish history including a coronation. It has stunning stained glass windows, intricate stonework, and a very peaceful atmosphere. The history display was so well done, and a visit to that church was a truly unique and memorable experience. The preservation of history was clearly important to its people, but sadly, there was no sign of community life in that place. It was more like visiting a museum. And perhaps the difference between those two churches takes us right to the heart of that tension that appears in scripture. 
It's something that the church has to wrestle with today. What is old? What is new? What do we do with our history? With so many buildings closing, it's so important that we don't lose the living heritage of our faith. We need to know where we have come from. Because ours is an ancient faith. Our spiritual roots go right back to the Old Testament and the life and history of Israel. The formation of the Old Testament as we know it is complicated. It took place over many hundreds of years. Many of the stories were first handed down through the generations by means of oral tradition. The story of Joseph and his famous coat of many colours is rooted in the history of ancient Egypt, the pharaohs and the pyramids. Later, and still with its roots in ancient Egypt, came the Exodus around 1500 BC, three and a half thousand years ago. Here in the UK, that would be around the middle of the Bronze Age. The Old Testament comprises all kinds of literature, from stories and songs to legal details and accounts of territorial disputes to dreams and visions. But throughout it, there is a consistent narrative. It is the narrative of the formation of a community, a community of people whose true purpose is to love and serve God and the world around them. It's the narrative of a people who so often get things wrong, who repeatedly have to be reminded of who God is and who they are. That narrative, sometimes violent, sometimes horrific, sometimes comforting, sometimes challenging, continues to draw us back to the living God at the heart of our faith, the one who in love creates and recreates, working with and through flawed human beings. And that narrative continues into the New Testament with the birth of Jesus, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. All this happened during the Roman Empire about 2,000 years ago. And this part of the narrative reminds us of the extent of God's love for us. Here's the God through all the changes and the chances of human history is prepared to walk with us, to suffer and die for us, and who in Christ raises our humanity to the heights of his throne. This is our story. This is where we have come from. And we need to remain rooted in that spiritual heritage that has been handed down to us. So we hear those words of Jeremiah, written sometime around the year 600 BC. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Those words resonate with truth and purpose. They invite us to look back, to return to the tried and tested ways of God. But the Christian faith is not like a historical artifact. It cannot be preserved like an item in a museum cabinet. And so we have Isaiah telling the people, forget the things that happened in the past. Don't keep thinking about them. I am about to do something new. It's beginning to happen even now. And somehow, we need to hold in tension the words of those two prophets about our past, about where we've come from. Because if our faith is to be a living faith, then we have to see the past alongside the present and the future, the other dimensions of faith. Where are we now? And where are we going? 
These are difficult days. News of the deaths of so many children in Gaza, in the Golan Heights, and of course in Southport, flood into our living rooms. Mindless violence and racist attacks on mosques concern us deeply. A respected news presenter pleads guilty to crimes of child abuse. The rhetoric of an American presidential election from those who should know better is downright offensive. So much violence, so much abuse, so much pain, so much suffering, so many innocent victims. How can a God of love allow such things to happen, we wonder. These things can and should challenge our faith. And alongside this, the church, as we have known and loved it, has changed beyond recognition. This is the world we are living in. This is why we need to know where we have come from. Without roots, our faith will not survive. We need to know and understand the God of history as the one who sees our pain and cries with us who stands alongside us in the mess and the muddle that is this life, and who calls on us to stand in solidarity with all who suffer. This is where we are now, in a world that is broken, a world that is so far from God's good purposes, and we yearn for God to do something new again. And it is to God that we look for comfort and for help in the midst of our own apparent helplessness. But where we are now is not the end of the story. And that brings me to the future dimension of faith. Because if we are to truly live the life of faith in the present, we not only need to be rooted in our past, we need to know where we are going. And I'm reminded of that promise contained in John's vision of the heavenly city in the book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. Here is the future dimension of faith. This is where we are headed, in our faith as individuals and as a community. We need to embrace and embody the past, the present, and the future hope that is ours through Jesus Christ. We need to know where we've come from, where we are right now, and where we are going. And I'd like to leave you with a final thought about where we're going. And it brings together our past and our present. In our reading from the letter to the Hebrews, the writer reminds us that as we wrestle with our faith, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We are to throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us and run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. This morning, standing here, I have been very conscious 
of some of those who have played an important part in my own Christian journey and have passed on. And of the encouragement I have enjoyed from those who in the past have fixed their eyes on Jesus and who are now part of the communion of saints in heaven. If you've been following the Olympics, you've probably heard of Alex Yee, the British triathlon competitor. Five kilometers from the finish, he was really struggling, so far behind the leader, the finishing line, and any medal seemed unlikely. Then he heard a voice in the crowd that he recognized. It was the voice of Alistair Brownlee, a triathlete himself, who knew exactly what Yi was going through. And that voice was encouraging him, telling him that anything can still happen. That encouragement reminded him to fix his eyes on the finishing line, and he found new strength, making up a whole 19 seconds on the leader to take the gold medal. We have a whole cloud of witnesses cheering us on. As we embrace or as we struggle with where we have been, where we are now, and where we are going, may we be aware of their example and their encouragement. And above all, may we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, the one who is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and everything in between. Jesus Christ, whose love is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be all praise and glory, now and forever, world without end. Amen. We sing together hymn 540. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Let us unite again our hearts in prayer. Loving God, our Creator who gives us life and meaning, 
our Saviour who gives us wholeness and hope, our Comforter who gives us comfort and joy. We make our gifts to you, the things we have, the time we spend, the people we are. Bless your church, the worldwide family of your people. We pray for our local congregations and community of Fountain Hall at the Stockett and at the Cross. And we pray for our ministers, Duncan and Tanya. Lord, increase all our faith. Use us to show your love for the world. Lord God, in Jesus, you have entered the world's wilderness and ventured into the dark and thorny places, the forbidden and forbidding places, the hot and hungry places, and therefore you have experienced the agonies of the uprooted and homeless. You have heard the cries of the hungry. You have encountered the plight of the tormented in body, mind, and spirit. Hear us once more as we hold out to you in our arms and in our prayers all those children of the wilderness who struggle desperately today. We pray this morning for the people of Southport as the shock of loss of young life begins to fade, reality begins to hit, and pain and grief are felt more deeply. Comfort them in their darkness. Give wisdom and compassion to all who stand alongside them in their suffering. And as we pray for them, we remember those for whom events of the last week will have brought back traumatic memories, particularly the people of Dunblane. We pray too for the people of Gaza and the Golan Heights, especially young people bearing the brunt of the war between Israel and Hamas. We pray for all who find themselves caught up in conflict, for Ukraine and Russia, as well as Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, and the whole Middle East. We pray that a desire for peace might prevail over a longing for power and revenge. We pray for wisdom for all world leaders at this time. We pray for a change of tone from the re abusive rhetoric taking place in the American presidential elections. We remember our king and his government, concerns over the economic situation, working conditions in the NHS and education and so many other areas of life. Help us to value all the opportunities we have that we might thirst for justice and right living, not only for ourselves, but for others too. Lord God, who cares about the fate of nations, we thank you that you also care about each and every one of us. And so we remember before you now all who are lonely or anxious or sad today, all whom we know personally who are in need of our prayers. We name them before you in the silence now. Teach us, O Lord, to love as you love, to mingle our tears with your tears, our compassion with your compassion, until that day when you will wipe away the tears from every eye 
and we shall be one with you and all your saints in heaven and on earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Moved by the Gospel, let us move. Hymn 247. And now go out into the world to love the Lord and serve the people, to love the people and serve the Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and remain with you all, now and forevermore.